Welcome to Metadale Online. My name is Matt Knight and I'm the minister to students here at Metadale Baptist Church and I'm just so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, if this is your first time, welcome. If you've been watching for a while, welcome back. Uh, today, Pastor Drew is going to be continuing his series called Stand Your Ground, looking at the armor of God. And today we're looking at the last two pieces of armor and how we can fight against the devil's schemes. And so if you would, let us know that you're watching by uh, making a comment uh, below. Also, grab a pen, grab your notebook, grab your Bible, and settle in as Pastor Drew dives into today's message. Well, welcome to week number five in our series, Stand Your Ground, where we're talking about spiritual warfare. Week one, we talked about uh, knowing that we are in a spiritual battle against Satan. Uh, week two, we talked about knowing our enemy, Satan and his army. Week three, we started talking about dressing for battle. We started talking about uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. Last week, we talked about the shoes of peace and then almost the shield of faith. And so today we are going to talk about the last two pieces of armor that Paul tells Christians that they need to put on in order to go into battle against Satan and his army. So let's see what those last two pieces of that armor are going to be. So let's hop into Ephesians chapter 6 and we're looking at verses 10 through 20 as Paul addresses Christian believers at the church uh, of Ephesus about spiritual warfare. So here's what it says. I'll be reading from the NIV translation. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. So stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And then in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. But pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. But pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much, Lord, that you have given us instructions about how to prepare for our spiritual battle against Satan and his army. And Lord, he is a vicious enemy. And Lord, you have given us armor that we're to put on in order to stand strong against our enemy, but not only in defense, but God in offense. And so God, I pray that you would Allow your word today to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, as we continue this, we're going to focus on Ephesians 6, verse 17 today. And it says this, take the, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Well, listen, when I was growing up, I played baseball all the way through college. And one of the most important pieces of equipment that a baseball player could have when they're hitting is a helmet. And what does a helmet do? It protects your head from getting hit by the ball. Well, I remember one summer uh, we were, our team had played, were playing in Athens. I was in college at the time. And so we were facing this team and this pitcher that I was up against was throwing in the 90s. I mean, throwing really, really hard. And so that guy, he reared back and threw a fastball and boom, hit me right in the helmet. Well, it honestly, I know that that sounds really, really bad, but it honestly didn't hurt because of all the padding in there. But you know what I did? I fell down 
like it absolutely knocked me out. And so I fall back. I mean, I'm out like I, I'm acting. I'm not moving. And so all of a sudden I hear my coach and my team, they're all running out and they're mad at the guy for hitting me in the head. And they're, Drew, Drew, are you OK? Hey, Drew, Drew. And I'm just laying there. I'm hearing every word that they say because I'm fine. And I let this go on probably for about 30 seconds. And then all of a sudden, I, whoom, I pop up and I sprint to first base. And my teammates and my coaches said some things that I can't repeat on here because I had scared them to death. They thought I was truly hurt. But it was kind of funny after the fact. But during the fact, it wasn't very funny. My dad was there and, and he was pretty concerned as well. But anyways, but that helmet, that helmet, it protected my head, honestly, from a very serious injury. But Roman soldiers, they wore extremely heavy helmets made of brass to protect their heads from fatal blows from the enemies. And they were so strong that nothing could penetrate it. Not a battle axe, not a sword, nothing. But Paul tells Christians to put on the helmet of salvation. So why would Paul compare salvation to a Roman soldier's helmet? Well, for one thing, a Roman soldier's helmet was incredibly ornate and beautiful. I mean, here you had all these ornate uh, scenes that were etched into the helmet. Uh, and then you also had this beautiful uh, color plume of either feathers or horse hair that, that stood up on the top of the helmet that flowed down. I mean, that was a magnificent piece of artwork the helmet was, but yet it also served to protect the, the, the soldier's head. Well, salvation is also the most beautiful gift that God could give anyone. The most beautiful gift. Sending a son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin because he loves us. Well, listen to me. Our minds are a six to eight inch battlefield and it's Satan's favorite spot to wage war, especially when it comes to salvation. And here's what I mean by that. Let, let me answer a few questions about salvation that will hopefully help you understand what I'm talking about. Well, first of all, what is salvation? Here's the deal. You and I, we have sinned. We have done many things that have missed the mark of God's perfect standard for Christian living. We've lied. We've used the Lord's name in vain. We've loved things more than we've loved God. And missing the mark is sin. And sin requires a penalty to be paid. And that's death. And more specifically, eternal death in a very real place called hell. And you and I deserve eternal death because we have sinned. But God sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty for you by dying on the cross. And Jesus, he took all of those sins, all of those things that you and I have done that are not pleasing to God, and he took all of our sins to the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, that he, talking about God, God made the one who knew no sin, talking about Jesus, to be sin for us. So Jesus died so we didn't have to suffer eternal death in hell. But when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, okay, he died on the cross. Three days later, he was resurrected back to life. And when that happened, salvation was made available to everyone who chose to turn away from their life of sin, turn away from their sin and choose to put their faith and trust in Jesus. Well, the Bible tells us that the moment that you put your faith and trust in Jesus, that you are justified. And this is a fancy word that means God declares you not guilty for what you've done. Your sins have been removed. It's just as if you've never sinned. That's being justified or justification. But next, the Holy Spirit begins to sanctify you. And this is another fancy word for the Holy Spirit doing whatever it takes to make you more like Jesus. And listen, this is not a fun or an easy process. Trust me, I'm going through it right now. If you're a Christian, you're going through the process of sanctification right now. But it is necessary for all Christians. But as a Christian must allow God in this process to renew their mind by removing their old ways of thinking and replacing them with God's way of thinking. 
And God doesn't want one single area of your mind to think like the world does. God wants every cell of your brain to be dominated by saved thoughts. And so one day, here's what's going to happen. God's going to look over to the angel Gabriel and he's going to say, go blow that trumpet. And then when Gabriel blows that trumpet, Jesus, God's son, is going to come down. He's going to get God's children, those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus. And that is when we will be glorified. It's a fancy word. Glorified is another fancy word for finally being made to look like Jesus. And this is going to require a brand new heavenly body. But this is all part of the process of salvation. You see, we we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Salvation is a process. Your sin is being removed. You're, You're being declared not guilty. You're being made to look more and more like Jesus while you're here on earth. And then you will begin to, you will be made to look like Jesus exactly when you get to heaven. So justification then sanctification and glorification. But that's, that's just an explanation of salvation. But then the next question is simply this. Can a person know with 100% certainty that they are saved? I mean, how sure are you of your salvation? If you die today, are you 100% sure? Are you 100% confident that you would spend eternity with Jesus when you breathe your last breath? Well, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, I love, I love these verses right here, tells us that we can know for sure. Once you put on salvation, once you put on that helmet of salvation, you cannot take it off. This, uh, the scripture, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, tells us this. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, the moment that you believed, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. So listen, the moment that you choose to put your faith and trust in Jesus is the moment the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And he becomes your comforter. He becomes your guide. He becomes your teacher. He is the one who convicts you of sin in your life. And the Holy Spirit living inside of you is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance in heaven. So you can know for certain that when you die, you will spend forever with Jesus in heaven, but only if you have truly placed your faith and trust in Jesus. And if you've repented, you've turned away from your life of sin. That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that we will never sin again, but we get convicted of sin and we go, listen, this isn't right. And I need to, I need to make sure I'm living a life that pleases God. So you see, when, when you understand salvation, okay, and that is something uh, that it is something that you did not earn, but it is something that was freely given to those who chose to receive it. Satan can't take that away from you. Listen, you you are protected just as a soldier's helmet protects his head. However, Satan loves to play mind games with you and tries to tell you that your salvation is not secure or that you can lose your salvation by doing bad things. So let me ask you this question. Listen carefully. If you did nothing to earn your salvation, what in the world can you possibly do to lose your salvation? You didn't do anything to earn it, so what can you do to lose it? Well, many of our problems come from not understanding salvation. So what is your thought on salvation? Is salvation just simply to you a a free ticket out of hell? Uh, which causes problems and doubts in our mind. Um, Are you trying to be good to earn God's salvation, which is absolutely impossible? You see, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, for it is by grace, God's grace, that you and I have been saved. It's through faith. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can brag about it. You see, God's grace saves us. It is not something that we earn or deserve by doing good things. We can't earn it by going to church. We can't earn it by giving so much money. It is something that God is willing to give us if we have faith that he can save us from his wrath, which is eternal punishment 
for sinners who choose not to place their faith and trust in Jesus. But listen to me. You are so loved by your creator. You are so loved by your heavenly father. And there is nothing that you can do to ever make God stop loving you. Romans 8, Paul tells us in verse 38 and 39, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to, to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. You see, Satan is going to feed you lies all day long that you are not saved and that God does not love you because of something that you did. But listen, don't listen to him. The Bible tells us that he does love us. One of my favorite verses that says this is Romans 5, 8. It says, but God demonstrated or proved his love for you and me in this. That while you and I were still sinners, Jesus died for us. I mean, that's what I call proof. What other proof do we need to know that God loves us? He died for us. He sent his son Jesus to die for us. So listen, if the helmet of salvation is securely tight, uh, is secured tightly to your head, no lies or accusations can penetrate your mind. Just like a Roman soldier's helmet, no battle axe, no sword can penetrate that helmet because it's made so strongly. So salvation means that you are saved or delivered from danger. And those who are spiritually lost are in danger of being under Satan's authority and control. So praise God that when you were saved, God rescued you from the danger of Satan's control. So do this. Put on salvation like a Roman soldier would put on his helmet to protect your mind from Satan's lies and accusations. And then Paul finally gets to the sword. So for the Christian soldier, uh, the sword is what Paul says is the word of God. It's the last piece that Paul says, this is what we've got to use to fight back against Satan. But Paul had a particular sword in mind when he wrote about this. The Roman soldiers, they would carry a a, a type of sword um, that was about 20 inches in length that was used for for hand-to-hand, close-up combat um, called the gladius. The gladius, it was sharp on both sides and it was sharpened to a point to be able to kill with even just two inches of penetration into the enemy's body. But God's Uh, God has given believers the sword of the Spirit to rip our enemy, Satan, to shreds. And Paul says that that sword is the Word of God, is the Bible. And the word, word, does that make sense? The word, word, here is the Greek word, rima. And rima means a spoken word or a quickened word. That means something that comes to you quickly. But this is a word that the Holy Spirit supernaturally drops into a believer's mind at a specific moment for a specific, uh, for a specific situation. In John 14, 26, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit, Jesus is, it says this, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I've said to you. So when the Holy Spirit gives you a word, he is putting a supernatural sword in your hand that gives you sword power in the spiritual realm. And we have already talked about recently, I think a couple weeks ago, the belt of truth, which represents the written word of God, logos, the written word of God, which is the primary source for the for the rima. So the Holy Spirit gives the specific quickened word to you and he empowers the word to do damage to Satan when you speak it. So have you ever experienced the sword of the spirit before, like used it, actually used it? Do you recall a situation where the Holy Spirit just gave you a word uh, in, in, a, in a specific situation in a, in a desperate uh, time of need? And when the Holy Spirit gave you that word, did you experience a supernatural peace about your situation? Just today, just today, I'm so glad that God has allowed me to speak and preach on this topic of spiritual warfare because I've been going through it a lot, a lot over the past couple of weeks. And so as I've been doing this, I've been telling myself and having to remind myself of scripture that God's bringing this stuff back to me saying, listen, I'm not fighting against people. I'm fighting against Satan and his army. And then also just 
just trying to remember um, that, that when I do fight, I've got to make sure that I'm armored up and then God has just been giving me these pieces of scripture that I've memorized and that I've learned at just the right time to help me out. So let me ask you this, how much scripture do you have stored up in your spiritual reservoir uh, from studying scripture, from prayer, from meditating that the Holy Spirit has to draw from to be able to give you it in a moment of need? How much? How much? Is it one verse? Is it 10 verses? Is it 100? Like what? What's in that spiritual reservoir? But not using God's word in your situation is just like a soldier going into battle without a sword. It's like him laying it down and just going, oh, all right, like what am I going to do? Like I'm, I don't have a weapon. And when we don't use God's word, it's like we don't have a weapon. So here's one thing that, that I do is I've got index cards and I constantly, when God brings a verse to mind or when I'm reading my Bible during my quiet time in the morning and I see a verse, I go, man, that, that's something I need to know. Then I just simply write it down on these different color note cards. And not every day, but most days I'll get those out and I'll just read them. And sometimes I'll pray, pray over them. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. God brings this, this particular verse to me often because I need to know, I don't need to worry. I need to trust God and know that he will give me his peace in that moment. So, so this is just one way that I go about um, giving, uh, putting scripture into my spiritual reservoir. But when the Holy Spirit gives you the word, gives you a word, here's what it's like. It's as if God is speaking directly to you through his life changing words. So think about this. Who are some people in the Bible who obeyed a simple word from God, a simple spoken word, a rima from God? Well, let's think about Noah. God told Noah to build an ark. He did. It saved him and his family. That's a pretty significant word, simple word, but it saved him. Moses, God told Moses, go to Pharaoh and ask him to set my people free. Moses did that. And then all of a sudden, uh, over time, you see how that affected uh, God's, God's chosen people, the Israelites. What about Mary? Hey, Mary, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. And she did. And that changed the world, literally. And then what about Paul or Saul? Hey, Saul, you are my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles. And God used Saul, who later changed, God changed his name to Paul in an, in an incredible way. But by obeying these simple words, these men and women changed history. They did. And so when they did this, when they obeyed, they fatally stabbed the, the darkness um, by simply obeying a rima from God concerning their lives. But most rimas come straight from God's word. That is why you must engage in scripture. Read it, study it, meditate on it, obey it. That's what you have to do. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So God's word can penetrate our souls to change us from the inside out. And a double-edged sword literally means a double-mouthed sword, a double, a two-mouthed sword. So a word that comes from God, the Bible is one mouth, but then when you speak it, it comes out of another mouth. So that's two mouths right there. So you must speak the word of God into your situation. And if you don't speak it out loud, it can keep you from achieving the victory that you desire. But when you speak it, you are taking the sword of the spirit and you're digging it into the enemy's ribs. And at some point he will flee. But if you only meditate on God's word, you will be using a one-edged sword, which is not sharp enough to kill. But speaking the word makes it a two-edged sword. But you receiving a quickened word in a moment for a particular situation completely depends on the presence or the absence of God's word in your life. And if you're in the word consistently, then you're positioned to hear from God and the spirit of God will give you the exact word that you need at the exact time you need it. You ever go, man, 
That is perfect timing. That's exactly what I needed to hear. That's because the Holy Spirit is giving you that word at just the right time. But people who receive Rima regularly from God are people who have made the Lagos, the written word, this written word right here, a top priority in their life. But Matthew 4 talks about the temptation of Jesus. And Jesus faced extreme temptation by Satan in the wilderness or in the desert as he fasted for 40 days. You may have heard the story, but Jesus needed specific remas to fight against Satan as he tempted him. And the Holy Spirit gave Jesus the words at just the right time. And here's what we know. Jesus told Satan three times, three different times, it is written. And then Jesus quoted scripture back at Satan three times. But we also know that Satan didn't stop fighting after the first spoken word from Jesus. He went back at him again. He kept fighting him and he even fought back with scripture. But Satan knows scripture better than any human being. However, Satan misquoted the scripture on purpose to Jesus to see if he would fall for it. But guess what? He didn't. But finally, Satan stopped after Jesus drew several scriptures from his spiritual reservoir. And it says that Satan left him until an opportune time. So he didn't go away forever. Satan doesn't leave us alone forever. And we can go, whoo, man, I'm done with that battle. Now, it might be done with that battle, but, but we, he's still going to come back and get us. But he left Jesus until he was ready to attack again. But listen to me, without knowing the word of God, you will be deceived by Satan to believe lies. But the word must be, uh, the word of God must be in you or there is no way that you can fight back. Psalm 119, 11 says this. It says, you must hide your word in my heart. I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. When we hide God's word in our heart, it allows us to fight back against Satan and his temptations and his lies and it keeps us from sinning against God. But as God begins to do great things here at Metadale and through Metadale, and God begins to do great things in your life and through your life, be ready for Satan to attack. You see, Satan will do whatever it takes to stop you. But are you willing to put in the hard work and effort of studying Scripture and speaking it out loud to stop him? You see, you just can't stand your ground in defense, okay? You just can't stand your ground. You must fight back using your sword, using God's word as our offensive weapon. Use your sword to help you stand your ground. So here's today's takeaway. Knowing and speaking God's word will protect your mind from the attacks of Satan. Knowing and speaking God's word will help you will help protect your mind from the attacks of Satan. So here's some application. Do you know how you were saved? Like the whole process of it? If you, if, if you don't know how you're saved um, and just some of the things that I explained to you, a great place to start is in the book of Romans. It's deep, but you know, uh, verses such as Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, verses 9, 10, and 13 those are what we call the Roman road and they help you understand salvation. But there's a lot of other things in there that help you. But, but ask somebody, ask a pastor, ask a teacher, ask, ask somebody to help you understand that. Uh, number two, do you need some scripture to use against Satan when he attacks? You see, we need to make sure that we're spending time daily in that, studying it alone. But it's also good to study it with other people. It's good to train yourself. It, you definitely need to hide it in your heart, but find the best way for you to do that. But here's what you can do. In the back of your Bible, you can look up keywords and there's a, a place in the back called the concordance. So if you're dealing with worry, if you're dealing with worry, some verses that you might want to look at are Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7 or 1 Peter 5, 7 or Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. If you need wisdom, check out James chapter 1 verse 5. Uh, if you need to know about God's love for you, check out Romans 8, verse 38 through 39, or Romans 5, verse 8. If you just need to know about the security of your salvation, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. So these are different scriptures that you can use. But where is Satan winning the battle in your mind? Ask God to give you a quickened word, a rima in your time of need. And if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, if you've never been saved, then that rima is not available to you. But if you would like to place your faith and trust in Jesus, 
It's just as simple as just knowing that the Holy Spirit is working on your heart, revealing to you that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And you say, Lord, listen, I know that I've sinned. And God, would you forgive me of my sin? Would you, would you come and take control of my life? I place my faith and my trust in you and you alone. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit will enter us the moment that we place our faith and trust, the moment we believe in Jesus. So I hope this has helped you today. And uh, just remember, the sword and make sure that we're putting on that helmet of salvation. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for your word. God, help us to be secure and know about our salvation. Help us, give us words from your word, uh, the Rima, Lord, in specific situations that can help us fight our enemy. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for helping us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for Metadale Online. I really hope you connected to God's Word through Pastor Drew's message today. A few announcements before we let you go. Uh, Vacation Bible School is right around the corner. This year's theme is Press Play, and we're looking at how we can have confidence through Christ. Uh, The dates are July 11th through the 15th, and it's from 5 to 8 p.m. with dinner included. And so we hope that if you have a, a child from fifth grade or below, or if you know someone who does, that you'll get them signed up at metadale.org slash VBS. Also, on July 22nd, we are having a serve day where we are looking to serve our community. We've got two projects. One is painting the exterior of the back. The other is serving at one of our homebound members' homes, doing some yard work and other maintenance. And so if you can help, we would love it if you would go on to our website, metadale.org, and find the scrolling rotator uh, for the serve day and click the link there and sign up for that. Also, on the next day, on Sunday, uh, May 23rd, uh, we are having a family fun day at the rec. From 5 to 7 p.m., we're going to have, we're going to be grilling out, we're going to be hanging out. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of good fellowship, and so we really hope that you will come and join us for that as well. And lastly, thank you so much for continuing to give to support the ministry of Metadale. Um, you can do that in a couple different ways. You can do that by mailing a check to 1811 Rome Road Southwest at Calhoun, or you can go online to metadale.org slash give and give online. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you'll do so again next week.